Oh, welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Like I said before the break, we're looking at um, psycho social issues affecting us as a people. And uh, in recent times, we have been plagued uh, with reports of uh, domestic violence, sexual based violence, and of course, uh, you know, sex tapes, uh, you know, about children and all of that. Uh, where we actually headed for. But right now, we'll just stay on domestic violence, and we want to know. Uh, we're asking questions. Uh, just how far can the church, uh, religious leaders, uh, you know, go? when it comes to the issue of um, domestic violence. Uh, you remember what happened with the case of a uh, popular gospel singer, Osina Chinwachuku, how uh, she was allegedly, allegedly beaten by um, uh, her husband. Um, eventually she died, although the, the, the case is still being investigated. But this time around we have um, the can, uh, chairman in Kaduna State joining us, uh, Reverend John Joseph uh, Hayab. Many thanks for joining us on The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. Thank you for having me. Good morning, fellow Nigerians. All right, uh, I'll just dive straight into it right now. What's, your, what's the church's position when it comes to domestic violence? Uh, most times uh, when issues like this happen and uh, uh, churches uh, or religious leaders would actually say that um, uh, the woman cannot leave the husband because uh, the Bible, that's what they usually quote for us, that the Bible or uh, the church does not support uh, divorces and all of that. But what's the position of the church when it comes to domestic violence? Yes, the Bible does not support divorce, but the Bible equally does not support evil, wickedness, brutality, and any form of violence. So just as the Bible does not support divorce, the Bible too does not support evil and wickedness. You see, I've tried to explain this to many Christians that when Jesus was speaking to his disciples and responded to a question that on what reason should a man divorce his wife? And the reason that was given was that on marital unfaithfulness. I think we need to look deeply into scripture and understand what is the definition of marital unfaithfulness. Because the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 says that whoever do not care or do ever fail to take care of his family or to protect his family or to provide the needs of his family, is worse than an infidel. And the same scripture says that you should have no equal yoke with the unbelievers, with infidels. So if someone beats his wife, batters his wife, wants to kill his wife, he is an infidel. So having equal yoke with an infidel is also contradicting the scripture. So we have to apply it based on what the scripture says, not just an isolated verse. Because I cannot, as a father, give out my daughter, and a man that claims to love my daughter now change in loving my daughter and become evil, beating her and want to kill her. And I say, no, 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 because we go to church. No, 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 because the Bible, the Bible tells me that I should have no equal yoke with a non-believer, with an infidel, because by his action, he has shown that he do not know God, he do not serve God, he, is, he does not fear God. When you look at the Bible in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, the Bible specifically says that men should treat their wives with respect, understanding that they are equal, they are weaker vessels, because the kind of treatment you treat your wife could determine whether your prayers will be answered. So if a man has will willingly decided that he does not want his prayer to be answered, that means the man is out of faith. So the Bible condemns beating or violence against women or violence against any human being. And whoever indulges in that has identified himself as an infidel and so should, be not, should not be treated as a brother. And so keeping a wife under such a person is not Bible card and neither are you helping her spiritually. Okay, so now, now let's come to, um, let's also look at the fact that what can the body of Christ now and the church do as a role in ensuring that domestic violence is prevented? Of course, not everyone uh, has the understanding of the scriptures that you have put out and not everyone would actually, you know, understand that scripture in different denominations across the country. So constantly you find out that victims of domestic violence, whether it's a man or a woman, uh, they don't want to talk about it. They constantly stay in the marriage because uh, for the fact that God hates divorce and that's the scripture that's predominant in their minds. And so they stay and some of them get killed in the course of all of this. So what can the church do in this fight against domestic violence? Well, before I answer that question, let me add here that when we talk about scripture, we don't talk about denomination. The Bible is not a denomination. The Bible is the infallible word of God. And pastors must live and teach the Bible, not teach denomination. I think, as I agree with you, one of the reasons why we are where we are today is we try to apply the Bible on the basis of denomination, denomination not on what God says. 
Because you have to look at the Bible holistically. It has no Catholic, it has no Pentecostal, it has no Protestant. It has only the Word of God. And people must live in accordance with the Word of God. When people don't go in accordance with the Word of God and want to go by church, then we'll be doing something evil. And when you appear before God, God wouldn't ask you as a woman who has been battered and killed, that, oh, welcome, you are a faithful member of uh, Equa, you are a faithful member of Baptist or Redeem. God is going to ask you whether you know him, you serve him, Honestly, but let me come to your question. The church has so many roles. The church is actually in an institution where she grooms, trains, and brings people to become better Christians. And as may, among many of the things that the church needs to do, is number one, the church needs to intensify teaching. You see, there's nothing education cannot do. But the church seems not to be doing a lot about teaching. What the church does mostly is only on weddings day. On wedding day, then the pastor will preach about marriage, about uh, loving your wife. And after that, you find many of the, our church don't even hold seminar on that anymore. Even the marriage counseling that we used to hold, sometimes we think that there are certain places that we don't want to talk about. It is a taboo. We must be open to intending couples for them to understand what it means to love, what it means to care, what it means to defend one another. Apart from that, the church will openly rebuke those who are found to be doing this evil and they claim to be members of the church whether they are elders, whether they are pastors, whether they are just worshippers, if there is a concrete report, confirmed report, that you are doing, you are acting violently against your wife, the church should openly rebuke you. The church has many reasons they discipline people. The discipline should not be restricted to those other ones. The discipline should also come on this. And not only that, the church must show example. Do you know that even some pastors who preach, in quote, are guilty of even what we are talking about? So if we don't lead by example, the chances is that people wouldn't learn anything. People want to see the love you show your wife. People watch our wives when we come to church on Sundays. They see how their wife, their faces are not shining, they are not smiling, and they'll begin to suspect, is everything all right? Is there a problem in their house? So we have to show that good example. So when the church right. teach, correct, rebuke, and this good example, we may overcome this. All right, uh, Reverend um, Hayab, let's talk more about um, the role of the church and the place of the church because oftentimes most people don't talk about these things and most people just uh, are silent about it because of um, stigmatization and um, sometimes um, the, the church uh, might, uh, some churches, you know, might give them the back door or the back seat over time. You know, for instance, uh, you are actively involved in the church's choir. You are like a role model and they, they're like, uh, what... Uh, what kind of modeling will you be giving to the other to other people or other members of the choir or the church if you're not divorced or if you are involved in issues of um, domestic violence? Most times uh, they ask you to go home and pray about it. And uh, even if uh, you are divorced, some churches would actually ask you to take the back seat because you are not uh, living by good example. So how do we even strike a balance? How do we know where to draw the line, really? You see, our job as a church is to help those who come to worship is to let them grow beyond where they came, where they are when they came to our church. If we do that, we'll be able to help them out. But you see, it is dangerous when you want to help a weak person and you are hiding his weakness. It is dangerous when you want to help a man who is sinning and you want to cover his sin. It is dangerous when you want to help, help a man or a person who is in danger, but you want to make the danger look as if it is hidden. I think this is where many churches get it wrong. There is need for us to openly speak about this, to openly correct this, to openly discipline those who do this, to openly rebuke those who do this without covering it. Let the man know that this practice is not, and the woman knows that this practice is not acceptable in our church. But even as we do that, we are not in any way trying to condemn them, but we are showing them that there are practices, there are attitudes that the church will not tolerate, the church will not clap for you. So these are the ways we will have people to come. But as you rightly said, many churches find it difficult to speak about this, and sometimes those who do this act of violence against either women or men are powerful people in the church, probably the givers of the highest offering. And so everybody is afraid to tell, to correct them, to rebuke them, and draw their attention to those things they are doing. That is where pastoral ministry is come to test. As a pastor, your job is to show the person who is wrong, a brother, what you are doing is wrong, and it's not a good testimony for our church, so we cannot allow, it's not just about putting him in the back seat. You see, the back seat is also a tradition somewhere, but there are certain ways we do, and church members will know this thing is wrong. Today, actually everywhere we are discussing this, 
But allow us a week or two. Once we, are, we overcome this story, we will forget it and we will not mention it again until another one happens. This is what we're supposed to be teaching every day. We're supposed to be reminding our members. Look, we're supposed to even begin to guide the teenagers. The teenagers must begin to see the fellow woman or the young girl by their side in class, the young girl in the teenager church as their friend, as part of them. You see, children grow up to think that any other person that is not like them, they are either above the other person or they should show the other person they are macho men. And that's how they grow, growing to beat young girls and grow to beat their wives. Or they learn to see their parents beating their mothers and they think that beating a woman makes you a big man. So we need to do this beyond just uh, putting people in the back seat. Take it to the children, show the example, bring them together with the parents, open up the conversation in church. The fact of all is that there are things women cannot speak or people are not talking just because we've not given them opportunity to voice out. When we give them opportunity to voice out, that would be, probably let me put it this way, that's one of the challenges we have with having a mega assembly, where you have people in thousands, you don't even know where they come from, you don't know where, uh, they, what they do. But in such mega assembly, we're supposed to have units where there are representative groups of at least certain uh, people, and they'll be able to check what is going on, how is their family lifestyle. But today, people are scrambling to have a full church where they will say, I'm one of the big pastors in town. And you don't even care what happens to the people's life. And they keep doing evil until something like this happens. Then everybody will want to hear about it. All right, um, thank you so much, um, Reverend Haya. But I just want to quickly put in one question. I want you to just answer me in a sentence. If a woman who has been battered, who is in a, uh, an abusive relationship, comes to you as a pastor and complains about um, what the husband is doing to her, what would you advise her to do? Well, it only depends on the history of the battering and how long they've been together, whether they start learning lessons of life. But so if it's an habitual person who has been battering his wife, if I'm a pastor, I would ask her to prayerfully consider whether she wants to remain alive and serve God or she wants to die and claim to be serving God. All right, thank you so much, um, jo um, Reverend Joseph Hayab. We do appreciate your time and all the thoughts you, you have shared with Nigerians this morning. All right, uh, Reverend Joseph Yabab, uh, Hayab is um, the Chen, uh, Khan chairman in Kaduna State. Mercy, you have heard him. What he said that I actually could take out of all of that is that this uh, conversation should be continuous because this is like in the front burner. Like after one or two weeks now, people you know, tend to not talk about it anymore until other new issues come up. But he said it should be a continuous and ongoing process. Yes, and, and the church needs to understand. But like he's rightly mentioned, so you have a thing of denomination and you have the fact that the scripture has been, you know, interpreted in different... Misinterpreted. Uh, misinterpreted and people constantly give different interpretations to so it. Yeah. People would read the scripture independently of the previous verses that you have. And that has also constituted a problem. Whatever the Bible says is what it is. You don't need to look for a dictionary to interpret it. It's that simple. But for me, what is most worrying is the fact that what happens, how do people move from being very sweet to be very bitter to a Just point a where you're like. taking a machete and then you're trying to stab another person and kill them and so see, uh, you know, take joy in inflicting pains on the other partner. Mm. I'm just wondering, how did people just switch, you know, from this side How to we the lost other our side? humanity. Well, that's the size of the show for today. Thank you so much for uh, sitting by to watch us. And of course, uh, you know, you can actually contribute on our social media platforms. Merci. And that's it on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You do can also subscribe to our YouTube channels at Plus TV Africa and Plus TV Africa Lifestyle. Many thanks for watching. I am Messi Boko. Have a great day. And I'm Justin Akadunia. Stand by for the news coming up momentarily.